Well, I regularly encourage people as just an important part of, of spiritual growth to be reading and spending time in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four stories that tell uh, the story of Jesus and who he was and everything that he did. And I know people, there are people that, that I know who came to faith simply by being challenged to encourage, encourage to read one of the Gospels. Uh, a guy that discipled me in college uh, was challenged to, to read through the Gospel of Matthew and went and sat in his college dorm stairwell and read the entire book of Matthew in one night. And that's what brought him to faith in Christ. And in reading the Gospels, I mean, they're all about Jesus and his teachings and his miracles, but there are also some kind of hard things to understand as you're reading through the Gospels. Uh, there's a pastor named Dr. Dale Burke, who's a pastor of a Fullerton Evangelical Free Church for a number of years. And several, several years ago, he did a, a sermon series called Jesus Said What? And it kind of took some of those hard passages, some of those difficult things that Jesus uh, said. I've seen some other pastors kind of take that same idea and do sermon series with that. Uh, but as we continue in our series called Encounters with Jesus, where we're looking at different uh, experiences people have with Jesus during his ministry. Uh, we're looking at a number of different people from different backgrounds and what their encounter with Jesus was like. Well, the story that we're looking at this morning uh, is one of those stories where in the middle of it, you're going to go, Jesus said what? And so Matthew 15 uh, is where we're primarily going to be. If you want to find your way in your Bible to Matthew chapter 15, we're going to start at verse 21. Uh, this same story is also told in Mark chapter 7. And I'll make some references to that uh, story as well. But Matthew 15 is where we're going to be focused this morning. And in this counter, in this encounter, Jesus responds to the persistent faith of a very determined woman in a way that blesses her, but also teaches his disciples and teaches us more about the extent of his ministry. So as we go to the story, I want us to look at what can we learn from the encounter that Jesus has with the woman in the story, what can we discover about who Jesus is? And as we go to the story, again, Matthew chapter 15, verse 21, uh, is where we pick things up. So it says, And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Well, okay, Jesus went away from there. Where did Jesus go away from? Uh, the region around Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum is the place where Jesus has been doing most of his early ministry. And this story is placed right after Jesus has had a, a conversation, you could almost call it a confrontation, uh, with the Pharisees and the scribes, talking with them as they've questioned him about their traditions and why Jesus and his disciples don't follow all of their rules and traditions. And Jesus has challenged them back, uh, talking about how faith and righteousness don't come uh, from following the traditions or the commands of men. There's been discussion over what makes someone clean or what makes someone unclean. And then right after that conversation, Jesus departs from there and he's going to go with his disciples to get away for a moment. And he's going to go to a place that the Pharisees would have decidedly seen as unclean. This is not where good Jewish people would go to this district of Tyre and Sidon. This is a foreign land. Uh, this is not part of Judea, not part of of uh, Israelite land. Now, these are regions that, if you look at the in the book of Genesis or in, in the uh, Exodus and Joshua, the distribution of the land, these are areas that do fall into the promised land, but they have not primarily been occupied by the Jewish people. They're occupied by uh, foreigners. This was a region of Gentiles. There would have been, been many different temples to a lot of different gods in this region. Uh, and this district of Tyre and Sidon, Tyre and Sidon are two uh, significant cities in this region. They would be in modern day Lebanon uh, is where you would find these two countries now. So the map here where Jesus has been, I've got Capernaum circled up there by the Sea of Galilee, that top uh, smaller blue uh, circle up there. That's where Jesus has been around the sea, the sea of Galilee. Where he is going is north from the Sea of Galilee. And you've got Tyre right there at the very top Um and so he is leaving the region around Galilee, going to this region that's also identified as Syrio-Phoenicia. Um, and so he is going away from a region that's familiar to a different, distinctively different place. Now I'm going to show you one more map. 
for the geography nerds among us like me. Um, this kind of extends it a little bit farther north. You can see Tyre on the Mediterranean Sea and Sidon up a little bit farther. You know, notice there's a little city mentioned right there in the middle, Zarephath. Now, if you want to go back and remember our study that we did on the life of Elijah, that's the city where the widow that Elijah went and spent time with. So Elijah went to this region to identify and to find faith outside of Israel at a time when it was hard to find faith in Israel. Jesus is going to this same region after challenging the Pharisees about their lack of faith. Interesting that Jesus would go to that same region that Elijah had gone. Now, there is also mention of this region of Tyre and Sidon earlier in the Gospels. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, I'll just read this mention where Tyre and Sidon is mentioned. Mark chapter 3, verse 7 says, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, that would be the Sea of Galilee, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea, and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him, and he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. So this large crowd that includes people from Tyre and Sidon have heard Jesus' teaching. They have seen him deal with, cast out, deliver people from evil spirits. So that gives us a clue about how people in this foreign land have already heard about Jesus and what he has been doing. People that have been traveling have encountered Jesus and have probably gone back to this region. Now, as Jesus finds his way to Tyre and Sidon, in the Gospel of Mark, it tells us that Jesus uh, is in a house, and he is staying there in a house with his disciples. Uh, and so the story in Matthew goes on and says, And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. And so this woman comes to him. She's identified as a Canaanite, which simply means a person from the land of Canaan, which is this area. Uh, now, in the Gospel of Mark, we're given a little more information where Mark says uh, the woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia. Uh, that means she was influenced by Greek culture, but she was by birth and race a Syrian Phoenicia. So in, ethnically by race, she is from that region, but Greek by culture. Uh, the Greeks had a tremendous influence in this area. They had a long history of trade and colonization in this area. And so she would have been exposed and, and uh, been, a, been around worship of all the Greek gods and all the idol worship that would have been part of that culture. And then she's also described as being a woman. So to a good Jewish man and the cultural views of that time, there were multiple strikes against her. She was a woman. She was a Gentile. She was not just a Gentile. She was a Canaanite Gentile, which was like the worst of the Gentiles to the Jews. And then she's got a big problem. She's coming to Jesus, crying out and pleading to him. Again, look at her words. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. And that word severely oppressed means miserably oppressed or wretchedly oppressed or oppressed oppressed to the point of sickness. And the request is for him to have mercy. Relieve me, relieve my daughter of this burden that we are constantly dealing with. And look at how she calls on him. Lord, son of David. That's not a phrase a typical Greek Gentile woman would have addressed somebody with. She knows more about Jesus than you would expect. She gives him this title that is a reference to Jesus as the Christ. She's demonstrating that she has some greater understanding and faith in Jesus as someone more than just a good teacher. Now, Mark chapter 7 again gives us some other details. It says, in fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. So she had probably heard these stories about Jesus from others from Tyre and Sidon that had heard about Jesus or even seen him. And now she hears 
He's not just out there somewhere. He's here. He's nearby. And so she's going to go seek him out. And she asks for mercy, begs him to drive the demon out. Now, in the gospel stories, there are a number of times where some kind of affliction appears as an illness that is caused by a demon. There are other times that the New Testament describes people as being oppressed or even possessed by a demon or demons. Now, I don't have time this morning to give you a full lesson on demons and everything that they're about, but I want to cover this a little bit. And as we talk about demons and how we see them and their influence in the New Testament and what is still true about them today, uh, I I always like to go to a quote from C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis said this, said, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils or demons. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors. That when we approach this idea of demons and, and the devil and all these things, you can totally ignore it and say, well, those things aren't real. That's just superstition from back then. Or you can see a demon behind every corner and behind everything that goes, on, goes wrong in your life. Neither one of those are accurate according to what Scripture teaches. But demonic influence was a very real thing in the New Testament. When it says a demon caused something, whether it was sickness, someone's behavior, oppression, it really was a demon. Now, there are lots of times that Jesus heals people and no demonic influence is mentioned. So this is not a statement that all sicknesses are caused by demonic influence. Um, But in this case, it certainly was. Now, is demonic possession or oppression something that still happens? Yes. We are still in a spiritual war. Scripture makes that very clear. Ephesians 6 talks about that. Uh, There are other passages in Scripture that talk about the spiritual warfare that we face. So in your own life, how do you know if something is from a demonic influence or from some other source? I don't think we can always know. Now, sometimes it may be clear. There are a few experiences that I've had where I'm pretty sure there was demonic influence or oppression involved. There are a lot of other experiences that I can look back and go, maybe. It's hard to know for sure. But we also need to be aware that within the Christian world, there has been great harm done in the name of trying to exercise or drive out demons when that's not what was really going on. There's a lot of really bad information out there, whether it's from movies, books, TV shows, or even questionable Christian ministries that go out really looking for these kinds of things. God's word needs to be our source of information about these things. What are we told in this world of of spiritual warfare? We are told to pray. We are told to resist the devil. We are told to be alert, to be ready. Ephesians 6 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The goal of Satan and his demons, Jesus said, is to steal, kill, and destroy. And he's going to look to do that however he can. And if demonic forces can discourage, distract, put us in despair, anything that they can do to get us off track. Now, I don't believe it is possible for a believer in Christ to be possessed by a demon, uh, but I do believe it is possible for believers to be influenced or impacted by the work of demonic forces. And I think we can see that in discouragement and despair that people can sometimes fall into. 2 Corinthians 10.4 tells us, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. So if you're facing a situation where you think there may be some kind of demonic influence involved, but you don't know, just pray against it. Calling on Jesus in his name and in his power. Just say, God, I don't know what's going on here. If there is some kind of demonic influence going on here, pray in the name of Jesus against that power. Trust for God to be at work in that situation. 
Now, clearly in this story, in this moment, there is a demonic oppression happening with her daughter. We don't know what that looked like exactly, but it was fearful. It was oppressive. It was constant. She is in desperate need, and she is pleading to Jesus for mercy. What does Jesus do? Verse 23, but he did not answer her a word. Jesus' first response is silence. She comes falling at his knees, begging for mercy, for relief. Now, what you believe about Jesus is essential to how you understand this story. As I read through the Gospels, Jesus doesn't do things or go places by accident. There aren't coincidences in the things that Jesus does in the Gospels. Jesus doesn't just wander aimlessly in his ministry looking for stuff to happen. His priority for this moment may have been time alone with his disciples. In the book of Mark, it says that he didn't want people to know where he was. He didn't want the crowds gathering around him. But I believe he knew this encounter was going to happen. There is a process and a purpose that's going to be at work through this encounter. But Jesus at first is silent. Well, maybe his disciples are going to be more helpful in this situation. Let's look at what they do. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. They are not overflowing with compassion in this moment. The disciples want her to go away. Send this Gentile, foreign woman, who is bothering us away from here. Now, I did read one commentator that gave the disciples some credit, like they were saying, Jesus, go ahead and heal this woman so she can get out of here. But you don't even really see that here. It's just like, get her out of here. Send her away. Do you ever have that attitude about people? People in need? People that might take up your time, your energy, your attention? The disciples are so hard-hearted here that they don't see, don't care, aren't responsive to the desperate needs of this woman that is coming to Jesus. They're like, Jesus, why do we have to deal with this? Why can't you just send her away? And then Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, it seems like Jesus says this directly to his disciples, uh, but I think it's also where this woman can hear what Jesus has said as well. And Jesus basically here is saying his first priority during this part of his ministry is to the Jews, to those Jews who are lost but who will respond to his ministry and to his calling about the kingdom of God. So he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Verse 25, but she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. She is persistent. You've got to love her persistence in this moment. She could be discouraged and go away after hearing all of this. So she comes closer, falls at his feet in humility, says, Lord, help me. That's a great three-word prayer right there for us all to remember. Uh, we don't need to have long, elaborate prayers. Lord, help me is a prayer that will uh, help you in a number of different circumstances. And then Jesus answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, in the Gospel of Mark, it reports Jesus' answer as this, First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. So at first, it seems like Jesus is ignoring her. And then she asks him, even more, falling at his feet. And then Jesus says this. Okay, wait a minute, Jesus, did you just call this woman a dog? It doesn't really sound like Jesus the way we normally think of him. And within this analogy that Jesus gives, so the Israelites are the children. The bread is the, the blessings of God and the kingdom of God. And the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, are the dogs. Now, the Greek word here is the word for little dogs uh, or puppies. Now, there are two Greek words that could be used for dogs. There was one that was primarily used as an insult for any non-Jewish person. And then there's this other phrase that's used as for, for little dogs, like dogs that you might have in your house. And that's the word that he uses here. 
But either way, it still strikes us as pretty insulting and demeaning. Now, again, there are a lot of different views on this passage. There are some people that say Jesus in this moment is being sexist and racist and needs to be put in his place. There are other views that say that Jesus was kind of teasing her and just kind of playfully doing this with her. Many views on this passage make Jesus seem really limited in his perspective and his understanding. But that's not what's going on here. Again, there's a process and a purpose for this encounter that he is having with this woman. And in his response, Jesus is challenging her. Jesus challenges her by giving this response back to her. It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Jesus' response was not to be rude or to be dismissive. It literally was meant as a challenge. And there is actually a a verbal interchange that is common in Eastern cultures. Uh, Sociologists have studied this. It's something that's still a part of what are sometimes called shame and honor cultures. And this is what's called a challenge repost interchange. And bear with me here. This will make sense, and it will really help this passage make a lot of sense. Uh, Challenge repost, and repost is actually a fencing term. And so what's going on here is some verbal sparring. And again, this is there is a pattern that you see in this, and you will actually see this if you, once you know about this. When you look at some of Jesus's encounters with others, you'll see the same thing go on in some of Jesus's other conversations. So follow me here. The process uh, is first off for someone to make a challenge or a claim or a request of someone else. This woman has already done that. Have mercy on me, please help me. Now Jesus could have continued to ignore her but he eventually responds to this claim. And the second part of this interchange is a challenge back, which is what Jesus has done. It's not right to give the children's bread to the dogs. And it's a challenge kind of given back to say, how is this person going to be able to back up their claim or their challenge or their request? And that's where we get to step three or the third part of this, which is a a defense of that claim or a, a reason for making that claim. And that's where we get to her response back. You notice she's not offended. She doesn't say, Jesus, how dare you call me a dog? She goes with it, and she responds. She says, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. So she replies back her answer, right, Jesus, I don't really have a right to ask this of you. I'm not asking for the whole piece of bread. I'm not asking for a whole meal. Just give me some crumbs, a little bit of your blessing, a little bit of your power, A little bit of what you came to do is all I need for the situation that I'm in. And then verse 28, then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. And here we see the the fourth part of this challenge repost interchange, where there is a, a public verdict of success or defeat based upon the original challenge. Now, if Jesus was limited in his understanding or knowledge, she's kind of put him in his place right here and proven her point. But if Jesus is all-knowing and all-perceiving, as I believe him to be in the Gospels, he is using this process for her honor. He recognizes her faith, and in his divine power, he has the authority as God. His power is on display here as he rebukes, removes casts out the demon. And he does this from a distance. He doesn't even have to be there. The daughter is healed and recovered instantly. So again, those people that see Jesus as limited kind of see him losing here, which there's no loser here. This woman is commended for her faith. She gets what she has come to request. Jesus demonstrates his power and authority that he does have the right to respond to her request. Now, Charles Spurgeon, uh, in a book called Praying Successfully, has a long chapter uh, on this story with this woman. And he's got three main points about her response. And I want to share those with you briefly, because I think they're really good and encourage us in looking at how she responds and what we can learn from that. Uh, First off, agree with the Lord. She says, yes, Lord. She doesn't say he's wrong. She's not offended. She knows she doesn't deserve anything from Jesus. She hasn't earned anything from him. 
anything that he does will be because of his grace and mercy that he is giving to her. We deserve nothing from God. She continued to respond in humility and in agreement with Jesus. And Spurgeon writes this, whatever the Bible calls you, accept it. Do not quarrel with it, for it is quite true. Whatever God's word has to say about us is truth. And she just agrees with the Lord. But then she goes on and she pleads with the Lord. She asks, according to his nature, his character, his word, his promises, she continues to ask. She agrees, but she comes back with another truth. Yes, Lord, but you can still do this one thing in your grace and in your mercy. You know, I see her, she is a real world example of a parable that Jesus taught. Luke chapter 18. And Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? And as I said, this woman is like a real-life example of that parable where Jesus is speaking about prayer and says uh, he was teaching that so that we should always pray and not lose heart. And one of the other points of that parable is that God is not an unjust judge. He is a loving heavenly father who wants to respond to our requests. So she continues to plead with the Lord. And then there is continual trust in the Lord. She has faith. Her request is based on her trust in Jesus. She believes that he can act on her behalf, that he has power and ability and authority to restore her daughter. Whatever she believes about him in this moment is enough for him to respond to her faith. And that brings me to my next point, that Jesus commends her faith. Just like we read in Hebrews chapter 11 of the, the saints of old that were commended for their faith. Jesus says, great is your faith. And that word great is the Greek word mega. And we still use that as a phrase for greatness. She says, you have mega faith. You know, Jesus often responds to his understanding of the faith of people around him in the Gospels, whether it's saying to someone, your faith has saved you, go in peace. There are times that he is amazed at people's little faith. Here he exclaims, great is your faith. But we also need to remember, we don't need to have mega faith. He wants us to have faith. As we read in Hebrews 11, without faith, it is impossible to please God. But Jesus also speaks about the power of faith as small as a mustard seed. But God wants us to have faith and put our trust in him. And she is commended for her faith. You know, in Mark, the passage in Mark tells us this. And he said to her, for the statement you may go your way, the demon has left your daughter. So Jesus also kind of commends her reasoning, her response back to him and how she uh, responded to him. Then she went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. So Jesus commended her faith and Jesus also commands healing and restoration. Jesus demonstrates his power and authority over the spiritual realm. She comes in pleading, desperate, in humility, and she leaves honored, commended for her faith with an answer to her prayer. Her daughter is restored by the power and authority of Jesus. Now, maybe there's something you've been praying for for a long time, and you're still waiting to get your answer. We don't know how long this experience had been going on for that woman. There may be time in our prayers with God before we see an answer to our prayers. And truthfully, we may never see the answer on this side of heaven that we hope for. On the other side of heaven, we can understand the reasoning for that. 
But remember the, the illustration of that parable where Jesus said, we can still trust in God to be at work. We might never see the answer that we hope for, but Jesus says to always pray and not lose hope. In that moment, Jesus is recognizing and responding to the faith of this woman. He's also teaching his disciples in this moment about his power and authority and his mission. Now, what's interesting is he will actually leave here right after the story happens, which again is an indication to me that that's why he's there. But he will leave the story. He'll go through Galilee, and he's actually going to go to a different region that's called the Decapolis, which is also a region of mostly Gentiles. And so from this experience, Jesus is going to continue to expand his ministry and his influence to others. And his disciples are going to start seeing that, uh, that he's going to be breaking down their boundaries, their bias against foreigners, their lack of compassion, their misunderstanding of what he's about. Now, in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, written for the original recipients and also written for us, he's teaching the early church that Jesus is for all nations. Even though he came first to the Jews, his blessing is for all people. And we see in this story the necessity of faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. We also see in this story from the bad example of the disciples the need for a compassionate awareness of the people around us. In your own prayer life, agree with the Lord. Know God's word enough to, to know how to trust him and respond to him. Plead with the Lord. Continue in your prayers. Trust in Jesus. We demonstrate faith in our prayer and also in our actions as we look to the needs of others. When we walk in faith, we grow in our spiritual life. And acting in faith includes being attentive to and responding to the needs of others. There's an internal part of faith and an external part of faith acting that out. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek or to the Gentile. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now, unless you are from Jewish heritage somewhere in your background, who are you in that verse? You're the Greek. You're the Gentile. We're the dogs under the table. Does that offend you? Or are you grateful for the salvation that God and his mercy and grace has given to you? Today, he is reminding us that he still has come for all and responds to faith in him. The same Jesus who responded to this woman's faith would also go to the cross for her sins, for my sins, for your sins. And he wants you to believe in him, to trust in him for the forgiveness of your sins, for you to receive the gift of eternal life. If you are a believer in Jesus, do you continue to seek after him? Are you bringing your request to Jesus? Are you living in persistent faith? Are you agreeing with God, pleading with God, and trusting in Jesus? Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for this story. Uh, even though there may be things in it that are, are hard to understand, uh, Father, thank you that you spoke into the life of this woman and responded to her faith. And Father, I pray for each one of us here. Uh, there are challenges and difficulties and obstacles that each one of us are facing in different ways. I pray that we would continue to bring those things to you to plead with you, to trust in you, to be at work in situations, even when we don't see and understand how you're at work. And Father, we thank you that Jesus came to lay down his life, to die on the cross for each one of us, so that we could respond in faith to receive the gift of eternal life. And Father, I do pray if there's anyone here this morning that has never believed in Christ for their salvation, that they would do that this morning. And Father, for each one of us, I pray that we would be encouraged 
by the persistent faith of this woman this morning, I pray that we would also be reminded of the purpose and mission of Jesus, that he came to seek and to save what was lost. So, Father, as we continue to have the opportunity to respond to you and worship this morning, uh, we pray that you would be honored, that you would be glorified, that we would leave here with a desire to honor you in our lives. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Let's go ahead and stand. Let's bless this name. My heart will choose 
Amen. Have a blessed week. So with all the challenges we face individually, nationally, and internationally, isn't it great that we that our God is not taken by surprise, that he is in control? Have a great week, and all God's people said. Amen. Yeah.